Hi, so uh, so we are from uh, San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, uh, which as Nick mentioned, uh, works to preserve uh, bird populations and their habitats through science and outreach. Uh, I specifically work primarily at the uh, Coyote Creek Field Station, which is a place where we uh, band birds. So that's how you end up with a bird in your hand. You might be wondering this uh, lovely yellow bird. This is a Wilson's warbler. Uh, we catch the birds and we put uh, individually numbered metal bands on their legs. They're very light bands so that they don't impact the bird's uh, activity in any way. But this way, if we or anyone else catches the bird again, they can look up that number and see exactly which individual bird that is. Um, this is a procedure that happens all over the world, this bird banding, and it's used to study things like bird migration, uh, the size of populations, um, how, how well they're reproducing, how well how they're being impacted by things like fires and drought. Um, so this is a, an ongoing scientific process uh, at Coyote Creek Field Station has been banding birds for more than 30 years. And uh, what I'd like to talk to you a bit about today is, is why you might either band birds in the same place for 30 years or maybe go out and bird the same place like Coyote Valley for, um, for many years, why, why it can still be interesting to stay in the same place and watch the birds. This is just to orient you a bit. Uh, so this map on the left here, um, right at the bottom of the map, you see Coyote Valley Open Space Preserve is that yellow dot. Uh, you can see that Coyote Creek in blue there is, uh, is just a little bit down the valley. Um, so Coyote Creek, of course, is, is at the bottom of Coyote Valley. Uh, if you follow that uh, north or downstream uh, toward the bay, you will eventually get to another yellow dot, and that is our Coyote Creek Field Station. Uh, so we're right by the bay, but we are connected to Coyote Valley Open Space Preserve by Coyote Creek, and, and we're you know, within this general uh, valley area. Uh, and, and uh, as our previous speaker talked about wildlife corridors and wildlife moving around, wildlife do like to move along the creek. Um, so you do get very similar wildlife along these two points in the creek. On the right, you just see a little bit of a, a zoomed in area to our Coyote Creek Field Station. Uh, it looks pretty small, those, those two little strips of green and then a little strip of grass in the middle you would be amazed how many birds fit in that, just those little patches of green. Uh, and so if you look at that and you think about how you can't even really see that on the big map, and then you look down where Coyote Valley Open Space Preserve is and you can see those patches of green, um, the, the amount of birds in there is just proportionally uh, really amazing. These are three species that you might commonly see in Coyote Valley. Uh, they are also species that we get at the field station. Uh, on the left, we have the ash-throated flycatcher. This is a pretty large bird that flies out and catches bugs in midair. In the middle, we have the ruby-crowned kinglet, which is a very small bird uh, that flits around among leaves and, and picks insects off of leaves. Um, the males have this nice uh, ruby crown, although it's, they often hide it and only, only bring it out when they're angry. And then on the right is the white-breasted nuthatch, uh, which is a sort of medium small bird that runs around and picks bugs off of bark and likes to be upside down a lot. These are all birds that you could see uh, in Coyote Valley, but you would be extremely lucky if you saw them all at one time. So if you look at the bar charts on the bottom there, uh, these are the sightings of these birds at Coyote Valley Open Space Preserve over the months of the year. Uh, so beginning with January and then going to December. And the larger the green bar is, the more commonly they are seen. And if there's no green bar, you do not see that bird at that time. Looking at the bottom, the white-breasted nuthatch uh, can be seen pretty much year round. Uh, they're just always there. But the ruby-crowned kinglet and the ash-throated flycatcher have uh, almost inverse um, presences over time. So the ash-throated flycatcher is appearing around April uh, and pretty much disappearing by right about now. Um, so this is a bird that is here during the bird breeding season. The ruby-crowned kinglet is showing up uh, right about now, uh, mid-September, and, uh, and hanging out until April and then, and then taking off. 
So if you go in Bird Coyote Valley, say once a month for a year, you will see um, you will see these birds in these different uh, in these different patterns. So you will see the ash-footed flycatcher for a while, and then you will see the ruby-crowned kinglet, and then you will see the ash-footed flycatcher again. And we see that also at Coyote Creek. The reason that you're seeing these changes in bird presence is because the birds are doing massive movements over time. So here we've zoomed out uh, quite a lot <laughs> to look at the ash-throated flycatcher's presence uh, across North America um, at two different time periods. So on the left, that's June and July. So that's their breeding season. Uh, and on the right, we have December to February. So the winter, so not the breeding season. Um, darker purple means more birds spotted. And you can see that these birds are uh, right all over California and even up to just barely into Canada in the breeding season. They're, they're breeding at that point. Um, but they then migrate south and spend the winter further south. And you would, it would be quite unusual for you to see one in the winter. The ruby crowned kinglet is doing almost the opposite. Uh, so in the breeding season, the ruby crowned kinglet is going up far north uh, to breed. And then in the winter, it's coming down and wintering here with us. Um, these are just two static shots, but I imagine them moving, right? So the, the birds all flow up north in the breeding season and then flow down south uh, for the winter back and forth. Uh, and if you're staying in one place like Coyote Valley and watching the birds, um, I like to think about it as if you're standing on the beach and these waves are, are coming past you and then receding and coming past you and receding. Um, and that, uh, and, and so you, you're in one place, but you can still sense these movements all around you as the birds go back and forth. And uh, you will see um, you will, I, I gave you sort of three example birds. I didn't show the, the nuthatches movements because they don't really move, they just hang out. Um, but all of the species that you're gonna see are doing some version of one of these movement patterns, um, whether that be staying put or migrating at different times, migrating further south or further north. Um, this is a collage of some of our most common birds we catch at the banding station. These are also common birds that you would see in Coyote Valley. And when you sum all these birds up, all of their movements, you get just incredibly massive movements of birds around California. Um, so just as a semi-random example, um, last week I looked up uh, the number of birds that were expected to be migrating over California on September 10th. Uh, and it was based on, based on our scientific understanding and um, actually on radar because they can look at bird mass bird movements using radar. Um, they, uh, they predicted that, or not predicted, they calculated that 5.3 million birds were flying over California um, last week uh, in one night. So um, yeah, even if you're just going to a single place and repeatedly looking for the birds there, you are, um, you're gonna be directly witnessing and being touched by these massive uh, bird movements. And I'm gonna turn it over to Serena now, I, I think. All right, thanks, Katie. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about our education efforts at Coyote Creek Field Station. And as Katie showed, Coyote Creek Field Station is located in North San Jose, Milpitas area. So it's a very urban area. And so we have opportunities to provide really unique experiences to educate the community and especially youth about birds, conservation and careers in biology. So we actually bring out student groups and community organizations to uh, Coyote Creek Field Station for banding demonstrations. So people get to learn about the process of bird banding, what it is, why we do it. And they also get to learn directly from scientists and volunteers who've been doing this work. And perhaps the most exciting part is they get to see the birds up close in people's hands. It's a really unique experience and it's a lot of fun for people. So in 2017, thanks to Measure Q funds, we were able to develop and expand our education programs there. We developed the Bird Population and Migration Education Module, which is a middle school curriculum where students get to learn about the resident and migratory birds that we catch at CCFS and that you would be able to see at uh, Coyote Valley. And the students also get to learn about the data that we've actually collected there. And so when we have funding available, we're able to bring these students to Coyote Creek Field Station. 
where they get to experience the banding demonstration and see those birds again. And they also get to participate in a hands-on band a partner activity where they get to simulate the process of bird banding and collecting data from each other. So these are some examples of worksheets that are part of the curriculum. So in these worksheets, students are getting to learn about some of the species that we have highlighted and that we've banded at Coyote Creek Field Station. They get to see the data that we've collected there and graph that data. And importantly, they also get to uh, uh, look at long-term banding data. As Katie mentioned, we've been collecting data at CCFS, Coyote Creek Field Station, for over 30 years. So by looking at this data, students start to understand the importance of long-term data collection and population trends over time for these different species. And all of these worksheets and the lesson plans are available on our website for free for any teacher or educator to use and engage students. And so we've been able to engage over 600 students with this curriculum. So here I wanted to share a brief video of an Oriole being released after it got banded. And I think this video really captures some of the excitement and engagement that students get from the experience at Coyote Creek Field Station. So if you can play that. Three, two, one. Oh, she doesn't want to leave. No. And there we are. So that's one of our favorite parts of the whole process. And uh, as we've mentioned, we've been collecting data at Coyote Creek for over 30 years. And so it's been a huge part of SFBBO's history and our mission. We're a nonprofit dedicated to conserving birds and their habitats through science and outreach. So Coyote Creek Field Station does a lot of that for us. And uh, it's actually SFBBO's 40th year since our inception. So we are actually celebrating with lots of different events and uh, opportunities to support our uh, operations at Coyote Creek Field Station. So if you'd like to learn more about those, visit our website, sfbbo.org. Thank you very much.